Bedtime Reading Peter Pan Chapter 1 The Darling Family The Darling Family was a family full of love. When they were very young, George Darling met and fell in love with the woman who became his wife. Their wedding was just like one from a wonderful book about young love. At their wedding, Mrs. Darling was wearing a beautiful white dress, and Mr. Darling was wearing a handsome black coat. As time moved on, they had three children. The oldest was their daughter, Wendy, then their first son, John, and then Michael. Mr. and Mrs. Darling loved their daughter and sons very much, and they were very devoted to them. Still, Mr. Darling often worried about the family's money. The Darlings were not a rich family. Now they were just a very normal family. With three kids to feed, Mr. Darling worried about the cost of everything he bought, even such common things as bread and eggs. Their neighbors could all afford to hire nurses to take care of their children. The Darling family, however, could not afford a normal nurse. Instead, they had to hire a different kind of nurse. The Darlings bought a large dog named Nana, and Nana was as good as a human nurse. Nana helped to bathe the children and get their clothes ready. She would comfort them when they had bad dreams in the nights. She even walked with them to school in the mornings, helping them cross the streets and carrying an umbrella in her mouth when it rained. Every night, when Wendy, John, and Michael were going to bed, Nana would turn on a small night light because the children were all afraid of the Neverland. They worried that the Neverland was always hiding outside and would come and capture them if they were not careful. The children did not know what the Neverland was like, and each child had different ideas about what the people who lived there were like and about what things that happened there. In fact, the Neverland didn't feel very scary. The children were only scared because they worried about losing their family and going to a world where anything could happen. Some of the children's dreams about the Neverland were similar. This was because they were all in the same family and they had all heard the same stories from their mother. Many stories talked about a boy named Peter Pan. Peter Pan lived in Neverland with the fairies and he could fly. Wendy especially believed in Peter Pan. Even Mrs. Darling remembered stories about a boy named Peter Pan from when she was a child. Peter Pan must be an old man now, joked Mrs. Darling to Wendy. No, Mom, cried Wendy. Peter will never grow up. He will always be a boy about the same age and height as me. Mr. Darling laughed when Wendy spoke about Peter Pan. He did not believe in Peter Pan or the Neverland. Nana probably made the children believe in Peter Pan, Mr. Darling told his wife. Dogs always have very crazy ideas. I'm sure that Wendy will soon forget about Peter Pan. But Peter Pan did not want the children to forget him. So that same night, he came to the Darling's house. He whispered dreams of the Neverland into their ears while they were sleeping. Wendy had a wonderful dream about the Neverland that night. The next day, Wendy saw that the window was open and knew that Peter Pan had come to visit. Look! she yelled to her mother. There are tree leaves on the floor! and he forgot to clean his shoes. 
Who forgot to clean his shoes? Asked Mrs. Darling. Peter Pan, of course. How could Peter Pan come into the house without first knocking at the door? Asked her mother. The door is always locked. He flew in through our window. Go upstairs and look. The tree leaves are next to the window. Mrs. Darling did not want to tell Wendy that Neverland and Peter Pan were just a dream and make her daughter sad. So she walked upstairs after breakfast and examined some of the leaves. She was surprised to see that they didn't look like the leaves that grew on the trees next to the house. Chapter Two, Seeing Peter Pan. One night, Mrs. Darling was putting her children into beds because it was Nana's night to rest. She washed her children and sang them songs as they fell to sleep. She decided to sit in the nursery for a while, as her children slept, and soon she also fell asleep. She had a dream that the Neverland came close to the nursery, and that a strange boy came into the room, and stared at Wendy, John, and Michael. While she was dreaming, a boy really did come into the room through the open window. He was wearing clothes made out of tree leaves, and he was holding a small light. He flew around the nursery, quietly looking at Wendy. Then he dropped to the ground next to her bed without making a sound. The light in his hand woke Mrs. Darling. She opened her eyes and screamed in fear, knowing immediately that the boy was Peter Pan. Nana heard Mrs. Darling scream and ran into the room. When she saw Peter Pan, she jumped at him, but he quickly flew out the window and disappeared into the night. Nana closed the window just as Peter was flying out the window. She was too late to catch Peter, but she caught his shadow. His shadow was now free, and it danced around the room. Each time Nana jumped at it, it would jump away. Finally, Nana caught it. The dog then hung the shadow outside of the window. She knew that Peter would come back later to get it, and she didn't want him to awake the children. The next day, Mrs. Darling saw the shadow outside the window and decided that it looked bad hanging on the house. She didn't want the people in the neighborhood to be angry at her, so she pulled it off the window and put it into a drawer in the nursery. It stayed in that drawer until the next Friday night. The darlings went to a party that Friday night. It would be a long time before the darlings could forget that night. Whenever Mrs. Darling thought about this terrible Friday evening. She would cry. I wish I hadn't gone to dinner at the neighbor's that night. I wish I hadn't poured my medicine into Nana's water bowl. Cried Mister Darling. That Friday evening had both started and ended badly. First, John refused to wash and kept climbing off Nana's back and running upstairs when she would try and carry him to the bath. Then. As Nana was running after John, she pressed against Mister Darling and got dog hairs all over his new suit. Finally, Michael refused to take his medicine. Nana held a spoon full of medicine in her mouth, but Michael would not take it. Be a man, Michael. Be brave," said his father. "When I was young, I always took my medicine." Why don't you take your medicine now? Suggested John. But that medicine tastes terrible, cried Mister Darling. It can't taste as bad as mine does, cried Michael. It's even worse, answered his father. I have a good idea, said Wendy. 
you can both take your medicines at the same time. Before Mr. Darling could speak, Wendy ran to the bathroom and got her father's medicine and a spoon. Now both of you can take your medicine at the same time, she said. Michael quickly drank his medicine, but Mr. Darling tried to hide his medicine behind his back. Drink your medicine, father, yelled all three children. Mr. Darling was embarrassed that his little son had taken his medicine before he did. So Mr. Darling tried to make the children think about something else. I have an idea, he said. I think that Nana needs some medicine. I'll pour some into her bowl, and she'll think it's just milk. He poured some medicine into Nana's bowl and mixed it with some milk. Just then, Mrs. Darling and Nana came into the room. Come here, Nana, and drink some milk, Mr. Darling said. The children stared angrily at their father, but did not dare to scold him. Nana quickly drank all the milk in her bowl. After a moment, she began to let out a painful cry and she walked slowly to her doghouse. The children all started to cry. You all care more about that dog than you care about me, Mr. Darling yelled at them. It was good for her to take some medicine. I'm tired of her being the boss of the family. I won't let her stay in the nursery any more. I'm putting her outside. He grasped the dog and pulled her outside into the yard and tied her to the big tree next to the house. When he came back inside, he did not dare to look at his children. He felt bad after doing this terrible thing to their kind dog. Before going out for dinner, Mrs. Darling put her children into bed and turned on the small night light. She was about to leave the room when Nana started barking outside. Nana is so unhappy, said Michael. No, that's not the sound of her unhappy bark, Wendy told him. She barks that way when she smells danger. Mrs. Darling went over to the window and looked outside nervously. The window was locked, but she felt very afraid. She was afraid that Peter Pan would come back. I wish I hadn't agreed to go to this dinner party tonight, she thought. The children could feel their mother's fear. They hid under their blankets. Can anything hurt us when the night light is on? asked Michael. No, my son, she answered. Night lights are the same as mother's eyes. They guard children when mothers go to bed. Michael wrapped his little arms around his mother's neck. I love you, Mommy, he said. Mrs. Darling did not know this now, but these would be the last words that she would hear any of her children say for a very long time. Mr. and Mrs. Darling left the house and walked to the party. The sky was filled with bright stars. They worried that Peter Pan was planning to come to see their kids again. They knew that he was just waiting for the adults to leave. Peter Pan hated adults. The stars watched Mr. and Mrs. Darling leave the house. The smallest star whispered, Let the fun begin, Peter, as Mr. and Mrs. Darling entered their neighbor's house. Chapter 3 The Neverland Arrives As soon as Mr. and Mrs. Darling entered their neighbor's house, a bright little light flew down from the sky. The light looked like a little star, but it was not a star. It was a small fairy named Tinkerbell. Tink turned off the small night light in the children's room and began to look around the room for Peter's shadow. She looked into all the furniture, all the drawers, and even into the pockets of the children's clothes. Tinkerbell was smaller than a child's hand and very lovely. 
She was wearing a dress made of tiny tree leaves, and a very bright light came out of her. She was bright because she was covered with silver fairy dust. A minute after Tink entered the nursery, the little stars blew open the window, and Peter flew in. He looked at all three beds to see if the children were asleep. Then he quietly asked Tinker Bell, "Have you found my shadow?" Tink pointed at some drawers. Peter opened them and pulled all the clothing out, throwing all of it onto the floor. Finally, he found his shadow. Peter Pan had never lost his shadow before. He thought that once he found it, it would just join itself to him again. It did not. Peter became angry and flew into the bathroom and found some soap. He then tried to join his shadow onto him with some soap, but he failed. Peter became afraid that his shadow would never join him again. He sat down on the floor and began to cry loudly. The sound of his crying awakened Wendy, and she sat up in bed. "Why are you crying, boy?" Wendy asked. She was not scared at seeing this stranger in the nursery. Peter did not answer. Instead, he stood up and bowed his head politely to her. "What is your name?" Peter asked. "My name is Wendy Mora Angela Darling. What's yours?" "I'm Peter Pan." "I knew it!" Wendy cried. "I knew you must be Peter Pan." Peter looked happy that Wendy had heard of him. "What is your whole name?" she asked. "That is my whole name," he replied, realizing for the first time that it was a very short name. "I'm so sorry," said Wendy Mora Angela Darling. "It doesn't matter," said Peter nervously. "Where do you live, Peter Pan?" "I live in Neverland," Peter replied. You just go towards the second star on the right, and then fly straight forward until morning. That's a very funny address. No, it isn't. Peter cried. Wendy then remembered that Peter was a guest in her house, and said, "Sorry. What address do people write on letters?" I don't receive any letters," said Peter. "Certainly, your mother must get letters." Wendy asked again. "I don't have a mother," he told her. Peter was glad that he didn't have a mother, but he didn't tell Wendy. He thought that all adults were very boring. Wendy loved her mother and felt a great pity for Peter. She ran to his side. "No wonder you're here crying," she cried. "I'm not crying about not having a mother." Peter said, "I'm crying because my shadow won't join with me." Wendy looked down and saw Peter's shadow lying on the floor. Wendy laughed at Peter when she saw that he had tried to join it to him using soap. "I can help you," she said. "I will sew it back on. It may hurt a little bit, but please try not to cry." I don't want my little brothers to wake up. What does so mean? Asked Peter. Wendy did not answer. She simply found a needle and some string and sewed the shadow to Peter's foot. When she was done, Peter ran around the room, dancing and shouting. I am so clever! I've put my shadow back on. Peter had already forgotten. That Wendy had helped him. Wendy became angry and forgot to be a good hostess. She jumped back into her bed and pulled the blankets over her head. Please don't go away, Wendy, Moira, Angela, darling," he cried. "I was just so pleased that my shadow was back." Wendy still refused to come out. Peter thought that if he said nice things to her, she might come out. Wendy, did you know that one girl is as useful as twenty boys? 
Wendy liked Peter's voice and his kind words. She looked out from her blankets and, a few moments later, got out of bed and sat next to Peter. Your words were very nice, she said. I'd like to give you a kiss now, if you don't mind. Peter did not know what a kiss was, so he opened his hand and waited for Wendy to put something into it. Wendy moved her face closer toward Peter, but before she kissed him, he put a button into her hand. Wendy was a polite hostess, so she pulled her face away from his and said, Thank you, Peter. I would love to wear this kiss on the necklace around my neck. Wendy did not know that wearing this button necklace would save her life one day. How old are you, Peter? Wendy asked. Peter looked nervous and uncomfortable. I don't know how old I am, he finally replied. But I am very young. Wendy thought that Peter was full of interesting secrets. I ran away from home when I was very young, Peter continued. The day I was born, I heard my mother and father talking about what I should become when I grew up into a man. They had many ideas about what kind of work I should do and who I should marry and how many kids I should have. I don't want to be an adult. I want to be a little boy forever, and I always want to have lots of fun. So I left home and went to live with the fairies in Neverland. Wendy was very excited by his interesting stories. She had never traveled far away from home, and she certainly had never met any fairies. Peter felt pity for Wendy and told her many stories about Neverland and fairies. Each time a child is born, a fairy is born in Neverland. Every boy and girl in the world should each have their own fairy, he said. But now many children don't believe in fairies, and each time a child says, I don't believe in fairies, A fairy in Neverland falls down dead. My fairy's name is Tinkerbell. I wonder where she went. Wendy became very excited and grasped Peter's hand. Are you saying that there's a fairy in this room? Yes. She was just here a minute ago. Listen. Wendy listened. I hear the sound of bells ringing, said Wendy. Yes, that's Tinkerbell. Said Peter excitedly. The fairy language sounds like bells ringing. The bell sound is coming from my drawers, said Wendy. You're right, cried Peter. Perhaps I closed Tinkerbell inside the drawer when I was looking for my shadow. Peter opened the drawer and Tinkerbell flew out. She began talking rapidly to Peter. Wendy could not understand the conversation. Because it was in the fairy language, but she understood that Tinkerbell was very angry. Don't worry about Tink, said Peter to Wendy. I told her that she could become your fairy, because you're both girls, but she said that she still wants to be my fairy. Wendy and Peter sat back on the bed, and she asked him many questions about Neverland. Where do you live in Neverland? she asked. With the lost boys, Peter said. Who are they? asked Wendy. They're children who became lost as children. Many of them fell out of their baby carriages when their nurses weren't paying attention. If a baby is not found by its family in seven days, the fairies take it away to the Neverland. I'm their leader. Oh, you all must have lots of fun. Oh, yes, said Peter. Peter was planning his next move. But we are all a little bit lonely because there are no girls in Neverland. Girls are always too clever to fall out of their baby carriages. I like the way you talk about girls. I think it's lovely, said Wendy. I want to tell you thank you by giving you a kiss. Wendy then leaned toward Peter and kissed his face. Then suddenly, She screamed terribly. What's wrong, Wendy? asked Peter. 
I felt someone pull my hair. Oh, it must have been Tinker Bell. She can be really mean sometimes. She told me that she'll pull your hair every time you kiss me. Peter then stood up and walked to the window. I must go. No, don't go, Wendy cried. I'll miss you. Peter agreed to stay a while longer. He told her that he usually came to the nursery window to listen to the stories that Mrs. Darling told the children before they went to bed. Wendy was disappointed to hear this. She thought that Peter had come to see her. You see, said Peter, I don't know any stories, and the lost boys don't know any either. Stay here, Peter. I can tell you lots of stories. I can't stay, he said. But you can come and tell your stories to me and the boys in Neverland. He pulled her toward the window and pointed out at the stars. I can't go with you. You know that, she said. Wendy was happy that Peter had invited her. My parents would be so sad if I left, and anyway, I can't fly like you. I'll teach you to fly. Really? She said, very excited. Peter, feeling that he might convince her to come with him back to Neverland, continued to talk. I'll teach you how to fly in the wind and talk to the stars. Really? She cried with excitement. And you can meet the mermaids. I'd love to meet the mermaids, Wendy said. And at night, you could put us in bed and tell us stories. Peter continued, "We don't have anybody to put us in bed at night, and you make us pockets and sew them on our clothes. None of our clothes have any pockets." Wendy knew that she would love to go to Neverland, so she asked, "Peter, could you also teach John and Michael how to fly?" Peter wasn't interested in more boys, but he agreed just so that Wendy would come. She quickly awoke them and introduced them to Peter. Peter and Wendy told them about Neverland and the lost boys and flying. They all became very excited and loud. Since Peter arrived, Nana had been outside barking. Then suddenly she stopped. All the children became silent, the way all children do when they hear the sounds of adults. Hide quickly," cried John to Peter. "An adult is coming." Lisa, the cook, came into the nursery holding Nana on a short rope. Lisa was in a bad mood because the dog's loud barking had annoyed her as she worked in the kitchen. She finally decided to bring Nana to the nursery and see if the children were all sleeping. When she came in, the children were all in bed. And they looked like they were sleeping, but Nana, smelling a new smell in the room, was still worried. She tried to quickly jump away from Lisa, but the strong woman would not let her go. She pulled the dog back into the yard and tied her back onto the tree. After Lisa returned to the kitchen, Nana began pulling hard to become free of her chain. Finally, she broke it. And began running fast to the party where Mister and Missus Darling were. She arrived at the neighbor's house quickly and jumped in through an open window. Mister and Missus Darling saw her jump in and immediately knew that something was very wrong at the house. They left the party and ran with Nana back home without even saying a polite goodbye to their neighbors. Chapter Four, Learning to Fly. While Mister and Missus Darling were running home, Peter Pan was quickly making the children excited about going to Neverland. He told them stories and flew around the nursery. Then he asked them each to try flying, but they could not. I suppose that we will have to stay home," said Wendy sadly. In her heart. 
she thought it was probably the best idea. But Peter continued to persuade her to come with him. If you don't come, you won't see the mermaids, he said. Then he turned to John and Michael and said, And there are pirates. Pirates? We must go at once, cried John happily. They tried to fly again, but they still couldn't. Then Peter told Tinkerbell to give him some of her fairy dust. He blew some of the dust onto each child, and the results were amazing. The children began to fly. When Mr. and Mrs. Darling and Nana arrived in their yard, they looked up into the nursery and saw three little people flying in the air. They then looked again and realized that there were really four people. Someone was in the room with their children. They ran into the house and up the stairs. They would have been able to stop the children from going to Neverland, but the stars saw them go into the house, and they blew open the window and whispered to Peter, Hurry, Peter! Adults are coming! Peter Pan knew that he didn't have any more time. Come with me, he ordered the children. He then flew outside into the night sky. Wendy, John, and Michael all followed behind him closely. A few moments later, Nana pushed open the door of the nursery, and Mr. and Mrs. Darling rushed into the nursery. The children's beds were all empty. They ran to the window, but could not see anything. The stars led Peter Pan and his new friends back toward the Neverland. They were flying toward the second on the right and then straight forward until morning. It was just the same as Peter had told them. Wendy was worried that they would get lost. She wondered how Peter could find the Neverland when there were so many mountains and seas. At first, all the children were so excited about flying that they didn't worry about the danger. But there were many dangers. Sometimes, they would hit a cloud and would not be able to see. Sometimes they would even become tired and began to fall towards the ocean below them. Peter would not help the children until they were about to hit the water before he would fly down quickly and save them. Peter Pan cared more about showing off to Wendy than about saving their lives. I'm hungry, Michael said. No problem, said Peter. He flew over to a bird and took some food from its feet. The bird quickly grasped the food and pulled it back. Peter then raced it for a long time. Eventually, Peter won and took the food. This was the way that Peter fed the children during the flight to Neverland. Peter was a terrible show-off. He was also often mean. One time, Michael fell asleep and began to fall to the ground. Peter watched and said without caring, There goes Michael. Save him! screamed Wendy. But Peter just smiled at her and waited for what felt like a very long time. Finally, he flew at top speed and grasped Michael's foot just a few seconds before he hit the ground. Wendy was angry at Peter, but she was still polite. She knew that they must be nice to Peter, or else they would all become lost. If he left us, we would not know what to do, she told Michael and John. We could fly back home, said Michael. But we cannot find our way home without Peter. We would have to keep flying, said John. We would have to keep flying because Peter did teach us how to stop. Peter could fly much better and faster than the other children, so he would often disappear for long times. When he came back, he would describe some conversation he just had with a mermaid or a star. Every time that he went away, Wendy worried that he might not return. Finally, they saw an island in front of them. There it is, yelled Peter. Look, all of the stars are pointing to it. Like Peter said, 
all of the golden stars in the sky were shining brightly on the island of Neverland. The children all looked down and felt that it looked familiar. Really, the children had seen it in past dreams. Now they were really there, and it was not just a dream. As they flew closer to the Neverland, the stars all disappeared. Suddenly, the island looked dark and scary. The children knew that there were no night lights in the Neverland, and also no mommy, daddy, or nana. Peter flew close to the children now. They were flying very low, and the tops of the trees were just below them. Everyone felt danger all around them. Do you want to stop for tea now or go and have an adventure? He asked. Wendy wanted to stop for tea, but John could not decide. What kind of adventure can we have? He asked. I see a pirate asleep in the grass below us. If you want, we can fly down and kill him. Peter said calmly. What if the pirate wakes up? asked John. Wakes up? I would never kill a pirate while he was sleeping, said Peter angrily. That's not fair. I always wake them up before I kill them. Oh, do you kill many pirates? Of course. There are more pirates in Neverland now than before. Who is their leader? asked John seriously. He is called Hook. Captain James Hook. John became very afraid. Wendy was nervous, and Michael began crying. Their mother had told them stories of the terrible and violent Captain Hook. Is he really big? John asked, now looking very respectfully at Peter. He's not as big as he used to be. I cut off a part of him. Which part did you cut off? asked John. With even greater respect in his voice. His right hand? If he doesn't have a right hand, how does he fight? He has put an iron hook where his hand used to be, and he uses it to fight. Peter looked at John seriously. Every boy who serves under me makes me a promise. You must now also make this promise. The promise is that if we meet Hook in a battle, you must let me fight him. I promise, said John truly. Tinkerbell, who had flown in front of Peter and the children, now came back to them and told them of some danger. She said that the pirates had already seen them and they had prepared their biggest gun to shoot them. They must have seen Tink's light, Peter told the children. Tell her to quickly put the light out, they all cried in fear. She can't. Peter explained to them. The light only goes out when she is sleeping. It is just like the stars. We must hide the light, said Wendy. Okay, put Tink inside John's hat, Peter suggested. The fairy agreed and jumped into the hat, but she became very angry when John gave the hat to Wendy to wear. They all silently flew after Peter. Suddenly, a huge shot from the pirate's big gun ended the silence. Boom! Nobody was hurt, but the power of the gun carried Peter far away. The shot pushed Wendy up higher into the air, and she found herself alone in the sky with Tink. Wendy would have been safer if she had dropped the hat and Tinkerbell and flown alone, because Tink hated Wendy. Tink loved Peter Pan and was jealous that Wendy would take him away from her. She planned secretly to kill Wendy, but she was too small to do it alone. Tink had an idea how to destroy Wendy, so she jumped out of the hat and moved her hands to show that Wendy should follow her to a safe place. Afraid and lost, Wendy followed Tinker Bell toward her death. Chapter 5 Neverland Awakes Neverland awoke when its people and animals heard that Peter was returning. The lost boys went to find Peter, the pirates went to find the lost boys, the Indians went to find the pirates, and the beasts went to find the Indians. The lost boys went out dressed in the skins of animals that they had killed. 
Each boy had a sword. They all walked in one line. There were always a different number of boys on the island. Before there were many, but some grew up into adults, and Peter didn't allow adults to stay on the island as a lost boy. Others left Neverland to return home to their mothers. Now there were only six lost boys on the island. Tootles was the kindest of the boys. He had very bad luck. Every time he left the group, even for just a few minutes, they would have an exciting adventure, and he would miss it. He would always return and find the other boys standing over their most recent killed enemy. Nibs was almost always cheerful and was a good fighter. Slightly was very proud, and Curly was famous for taking the blame for other people's mistakes. The last two boys were twins, and they were always close together. The pirates were a terrible and violent group. The pirate named Seco was famous because he would always write his name on the bodies of his killed enemies using their own blood. The pirate Bill Jukes once killed a hundred men in a single day, and his whole body was covered with dark tattoos. Gentleman Starkey also loved to kill, but was always very clean and wore nice clothes. The shipman Smee was very ugly and often would kill people just for fun. He carried a weapon called the corkscrew because it looked like a corkscrew that people used to open wine bottles. There were two other pirates called Noodler, whose hands had six fingers, and Skylights. Who only had one eye. The terrible captain James Hook was lying comfortably in a carriage that his men pulled. He was the most violent pirate of the group. He was also the largest and darkest. He had long black hair that was arranged in curls. Strangely, he had lovely blue eyes. They didn't look like pirate eyes, but when he was killing. They became bright red and horrible to look at. Captain Hook was famous for having amazing courage, but he was not always brave. He was scared of two things: the great crocodile that lived on the island and looking at his own blood. It was thick and purple instead of red. Hook was always smoking two cigars at the same time. The most scary and horrible thing about Captain Hook was his missing right hand. He now had an iron hook instead of a hand, and he used it to kill all his enemies. Hook would always kill his enemies in the same way. He would cut into his enemy with his hook and then kick their bodies away. He would do all this while smoking his two cigars. This was Peter Pan's terrible enemy. Both of them were like kings in Neverland, but which of the two would kill the other and win the final battle for the leadership of the island? Many Indians also lived on the island. They, like the pirates, were famous for being cruel to their enemies. Still, they did not like or hate the lost boys. The Indians only hated the pirates. They were always moving silently around the island, hunting the pirates. They carried sharp swords and knives, and they covered their bodies with bright war paint. Each time they killed a pirate, they would cut off their hair and hang it on a rope around their necks. The biggest Indian was Great Big Tiger. He always walked in front of the other Indians. He carried the hair of so many pirates that it was difficult for him to walk. The other famous Indian was Tiger Lily. She was an amazingly beautiful and brave young woman who all the Indian men loved. She liked to be alone and kept the men away from her with her knife. On this night that Peter returned to the island, the Indians were all full of food and wine. The beasts that followed the Indians around the island were still thin, angry, mean, and very hungry. These beasts included 
tigers, lions, and bears. They were so hungry that their tongues hung out of their mouths as they followed the Indians. The most terrible and famous of these beasts was a huge crocodile. This beast was always searching for the same target. That target was Captain Hook. You, the reader, will soon learn all about this crocodile. After the boys had walked around the small island several times, they decided to rest near their home. Where is Peter? I wish he would come back faster, said Tootles. I want to hear his stories about Cinderella. I think my mother must have been just like Cinderella. The other boys all nodded their heads. Peter would not let them talk about mothers when he was there, but they often talked about mothers freely when he wasn't there. They soon stopped talking, though. They became silent because they heard the pirates singing their terrible song. The boys quickly jumped into six small holes, each hole cut in its own trees. Each hole was the same size as one of the boys. So that big adults could not get in, they had disappeared before the pirates arrived. They had a very strange home. The pirates had looked for it for many years, but the entrances were very hard to see. Each boy, including Peter Pan, had his own entrance. The seven entrances were all hidden well. Only by moving some piles of leaves and wood could somebody discover them. When the pirates came close, Seko saw Nibs running through the forest. He lifted his gun up, but Hook used his hook hand to pull down his gun and stop him. Let me kill him, Seko begged. No, said Hook. The Indians will hear the noise from your gun. Do you want to be killed? They'll cut off your head. Also, one boy isn't enough. I want to kill all those boys at the same time. Hook then turned towards Smee, his most loyal pirate. Only one of those boys is important to me. Their captain, Peter Pan. I want revenge on Pan. He cut off my hand and fed it to the great crocodile of the island. Now I understand why you are so afraid of crocodiles," Smee said. "No, I'm not afraid of all crocodiles," Hook corrected him. "I'm only afraid of that one crocodile. It thought my hand was so delicious that it has followed me for a long time, waiting to eat all of me." Hook then sat down on a huge mushroom. And lifted up his hook hand. That crocodile would have already eaten me, Smee, but I fed it an old clock that is always making a loud tick, tick, tick sound. When I hear that tick, I always run to get away. Some day, said Smee, that clock will stop working, and then you won't be able to hear the crocodile. Yes, said Hook. I'm afraid of that time," Hook whispered. Suddenly, Hook jumped up and screamed in pain. "What's the problem?" Smee asked. "This mushroom seat is really hot," Hook exclaimed. "My legs are burning hot." The two pirates looked down at the mushroom where Hook was sitting. It was the biggest mushroom they had ever seen. They tried to pull it out of the ground, and it came out easily. They saw that the mushroom didn't have any roots. Even stranger, smoke was coming out of the place where the mushroom was before. It's a chimney! Yelled Hook. The pirates had found the chimney of the lost boys' secret home. When enemies were close, the lost boys always covered the chimney. With a mushroom, the boys were inside speaking loudly. They were making plans to welcome Peter Pan home. The pirates listened to their conversation for a while. They all smiled and put the mushroom back in its old place.
They then searched around and discovered the holes in the trees. It's time to kill them all, like you wanted, Captain," laughed Smee. His eyes were bright with excitement. "Yes," said Hook. "I have a plan. We will first return to our ship. We will then cook a big cake covered with green sugar. But that is not all. We will also put poison in the cake." We'll then put the cake near the mermaid's lake. The boys often swim and play there. When they find and eat the cake, they will all die. Your plan sounds delicious," exclaimed Smee, and all the pirates began to sing. Just as they finished singing, they heard another sound: tick, tick, tick. It's the great crocodile," said Hook, terrified. He ran away quickly, followed by Smee and the other pirates. The boys soon left their secret home and came back outside. They were safe again. Look! Shouted Nibs. There's a huge white bird flying towards us. The boys all looked toward the sky. The bird looks tired, and it sounds like it is crying," said Curly. In reality, it was not a bird. It was Wendy. Wendy was now quite close to the boys. Tinker Bell was flying all around her and hitting her with her little fists. Tink then flew down to the boys and said, "Peter wants you to kill Wendy." "Okay," replied the boys happily. The lost boys always listened to Peter's orders. They quickly jumped down into their secret home. And got their bows and arrows. Toodles came back fastest and prepared his bow. Move, Tink! He shouted. He then fired an arrow into Wendy's chest. Wendy fell straight down to the ground with a loud sound. Chapter Six: The Lost Boy's New Mother. I have killed Wendy. Peter will be so pleased with me. Cried Toodles with a smile, but he stopped smiling when he went and saw Wendy's body. This isn't a big bird, cried slightly in fear. I think this is a lady. She must be what Peter wanted to bring us, said Nibs, and we have killed her. Just at this moment, Peter flew over to them and landed. The lost boys stared at him and became very scared. Aren't you happy that I'm back? Peter asked. The boys were too scared to open their mouths. Peter laughed. I have great news. I have found you all a mother. The boys were still silent. Peter began to look troubled. You should have seen her. She flew over this way. Finally, the boys turned around and pointed at Wendy's body on the ground. Peter did not say anything; he just stared at her body. Then he walked over to her and gently pulled the arrow out of her chest. He turned to the boys, and his face became very angry. "Who shot this arrow?" he asked seriously. "I did," said Toodles. Peter then picked up a bow and put the arrow on it. Just as he was aiming the bow at Toodles. Curly cried, "Wait! The lady is lifting her arm. She is alive." Peter ran over to her and sat down. He realized that Toodles' arrow had hit the button necklace that Wendy was wearing around her neck. The button that Peter gave her had saved her life. "Listen," said Nibs. "Tinkle Bell is crying." He pointed to the fairy flying above them. "Tink told us to shoot the Wendy." She said that you wanted us to kill her," Toodles told Peter. Peter became angrier than he had ever been. "Leave!" he screamed at the fairy, "and don't come back here for a very long time." The boys talked about what to do with Wendy while she was recovering. "Let's carry her into our secret house," suggested Slightly. "No," replied Peter. 
You must not touch a lady. That is not respectful. But if she lies outside, she will certainly die, cried Tootles. We will have to build a house around her, said Peter. He measured Wendy's body and decided how big the house should be. Let's work, boys. Get all the tools and strong wood that you can find. Just then, John and Michael arrived. They were very tired from flying, and they almost could not stand up. But Peter made them work also. We must build a house for Wendy, he told them. We are all her servants. Her servants? John cried. But Wendy is just a girl. Wendy suddenly began singing. I wish I had a lovely house, the smallest ever seen, with beautiful little red walls. And roof of bright green. The boys were all happy to hear her sing because they had found red wood and the ground was covered with green grass. They all sang to Wendy as they worked. We'll build little walls and a roof and we'll make a lovely door. Please tell us, our mother Wendy, do you want anything more? Wendy sang her answer. Oh, now I want to have. Happy windows all around, with roses in the garden and smiling babies warm inside. The lost boys made windows by hitting their fists through the red wood, and they made covers for the windows using yellow leaves. But sadly, there were no roses and babies, and they had to pretend. When the house was finished, they could not see Wendy because she was built inside. If you want to see her, you must first knock on the door, said Peter. You must always be very polite to Wendy and act like gentlemen. The door did not have a knocker, so Tootles took off his shoe and hung it on the door. Wendy came to the door, and the boys all took off their hats. We've built this house to give you, Tootles told her. It's beautiful, Wendy smiled. All the boys then sat on one knee and held out their arms, begging, Wendy, lady, please, will you be our mother? Do you really want me to? she replied. I'm just a little girl. I don't have any experience as a mother. That's okay, Peter said. You'll still make a wonderful mother. Wendy thought for a minute. Okay, she said. I will try my best. Now come inside and take off your shoes, you boys. Your feet must be wet and cold. Soon I will put you all to bed, and I promise to tell you a story. Chapter 7 The Secret House Wendy spent her first few days in Neverland sleeping and recovering from the arrow. At night, she would go down into the boys' secret house and tell them stories as she put them in bed. After they all fell asleep, she would return to her own little house and sleep. Peter would always wait outside Wendy's door and guard against the pirates and beasts. Peter measured Michael, John, and Wendy and cut holes in trees for them. The holes were all cut the same size as one person, so they could go in and out of the secret house quickly. They all liked their secret underground home. This home had one large room where the boys would eat, sleep, talk, and play. Large mushrooms grew out of the floor quickly, and they used them as seats. There was also a tree growing in the center of the floor. Every morning, the boys used it as a table for their breakfast and then cut it flat with the floor so that they had more space to play. The tree grew so fast that by lunchtime they could eat lunch on it. On one side of the room, the boys had built a fireplace. Wendy hung a rope above it to dry the boys' clothes after she washed them. There was a huge bed on the other side of the room. All the lost boys slept in it, including John, too. The bed was so full that nobody could turn over unless they all turned over at the same time. 
The only boy who did not sleep in the big bed was Michael. He slept in a small box near Wendy, so that she could pretend that he was her little baby. One side of the room belonged to Tink. Tink's area was separated from the boy's side of the room by a blue cloth. Tinker Bell had very beautiful furniture and a soft bed, and she was very neat and tidy. Wendy began to teach the lost boys to read and write. They all tried hard to learn, except Peter, who said that he was too busy. The truth was that he didn't have the patience for reading. He thought it was an activity for adults. Peter was the only boy on the island who couldn't write his own name. Wendy often thought about her parents. She did not want to forget them. She would try to help her brothers remember them. By asking them test questions like, "What color was Mommy's hair? How tall was Father? What was our dog's name?" Wendy did become the lost boy's mother, and she now had nine children. She was so busy washing, sewing, and cooking that she often did not have any free time to leave the house. She cooked roasted fruit and potatoes. She baked pigs with apples, and they drank a lot of fresh juice. Sometimes they ate real meals, and sometimes they ate pretended ones. Peter always decided which. The pretended meals felt so real to the boys that you could see them getting fat as they ate. The boys had many adventures. Their adventures, like their meals, were sometimes real and sometimes pretended. Peter often went out alone, and he always told stories about what adventures he had when he came home. Wendy and the lost boys never knew whether he'd had a real adventure or not. Peter himself couldn't even remember. Wendy knew that some of the adventures were true because she went on some of them. For example, Wendy found the poison cake. That the pirates had made to kill the boys. The pirates put many cakes in many clever places to trick the boys, but Wendy found all the cakes and threw them into the lake. Wendy also went with Peter on many other adventures. She saw him fight wild beasts and talk with the mermaids. Often Peter would hunt pigs, while Wendy found fruit. Wendy liked going out on adventures with Peter. She did not feel that Peter was her child like the rest of the lost boys. Peter was different. Chapter Eight, Death Rock. In the center of Neverland Island was a great lake. The water was like a mirror and was filled with many different bright colors. The lake was the home of many mermaids. They would play in the lake all day, and when they were tired, they would take naps on a large rock in the center of the lake. The rock was called Death Rock, and it got this name because the pirates would often tie up people with ropes and leave them on the rock. The water in the lake became high every night, and the people would be covered with water and drown. When the children swam in the lake. The mermaids would always swim away. The mermaids did not like Wendy and the boys. They only liked Peter Pan. He often swam over to them and chatted with them. One day, a mermaid gave him her comb that she used for her long hair. He later gave it to Wendy. Wendy told the boys that they had to rest on the rock for twenty minutes after eating lunch. Even if they only ate a pretended meal, she would sit with them on the rock and sew their clothing. The rock was small, about the same size as the boys' beds, but the boys could all fit on it. One day, when Wendy and the boys were sitting on the rock, a sudden change happened in the lake. The sun disappeared behind thick clouds, and it became so dark that Wendy could not see her sewing needle. The water became very cold, and the wind stopped. 
Wendy heard a sound from far away. It was the sound of a large boat. Wendy was afraid and wanted to awake the sleeping boys, but she didn't want them to swim just after eating lunch, so she did not. Luckily, Peter could feel danger even when he was sleeping. He woke up and jumped to his feet. Pirates! He shouted, and the children all awoke afraid. Swim! Peter ordered. The boys all quickly jumped into the water and swam away. The pirate ship moved closer and closer to the rock. Starkey and Smee were on it, and so was the Indian, Tiger Lily. Smee had caught her as she was climbing onto their ship with a knife in her mouth. They tied her up with rope and threw her down onto Death Rock. Peter and Wendy swam under the pirate ship so that no one could see them. Wendy felt a great pity for the Indian girl and did not want to see her die. Peter felt angry because the pirates did not fight fairly. Many pirates had fought against just Tiger Lily. Peter planned to save Tiger Lily. He could have waited until the pirates left before saving her, but Peter never did anything the easy way. Instead, he thought of a different plan. Peter could imitate many sounds and many voices, so he imitated Captain Hook's voice. Hey, Smee! he called. I hear the captain, said Smee to Starkey. He must be swimming out to the ship to meet us. Hey, captain! We tied up Tugger Lily and are leaving her on the rock to die. Smee called out happily. Let her go free, said Peter, imitating Hook's voice. Free? Smee cried, feeling very shocked. Yes, cut the ropes and let her free. Why, Captain? Do it at once, it is my order, the voice said seriously and loudly. Do it. Or I'll push my hook into your heart slowly. This is very strange, said Smee to Starkey. We'd better do it, Captain Hook orders, said Starkey nervously. He was terrified of the captain's hook. Okay, Captain, Smee answered, and he took out his knife and cut the ropes that were around Tiger Lily's hands and feet. She quickly jumped into the lake and disappeared. Wendy thought Peter's clever trick was very wonderful. But before she could praise him, they heard the real voice of Captain Hook coming from over the lake. Boat coming! yelled Captain Hook. Smee and Starkey looked out into the water and saw Captain Hook in a little boat rowing toward the ship. Peter and Wendy watched him use his iron hook to climb up the side of the boat. Hook sat down on the boat and looked sadly down at the ground. What's wrong, Captain? asked Smee. We have lost, said Hook sadly. The lost boys have found a mother. This is terrible, cried Starkey. I don't understand. What's a mother? asked Smee. The captain stood up and pointed out into the water. Smee looked and saw a strange thing. There was a large bird's nest floating on the lake, and a large bird was sitting on it. That is a mother, Hook said to Smee. A mother cares for her children. Her nest must have fallen into the lake, but a mother never leaves her eggs. Smee thought for a moment. If they have a mother, maybe she's here to care for Peter Pan. That is what worries me, Hook said. I have an idea, Captain, said Smee. We can catch the boy's new mother and make her become our mother. That's an excellent idea, Hook replied. We will first catch the lost boys and carry them to the ship. We'll then make them jump into the water and we'll make Wendy into our mother. They all smiled a long, terrible smile. Suddenly, Hook remembered about Tiger Lily. Where is the Indian girl? he asked. Well, we let her free like you ordered, replied Smee. You let her go? 
shouted Hook angrily. You called to us from across the lake and told us to cut her ropes. I certainly did not, shouted Hook, becoming extremely angry. Something very strange is happening here. The captain jumped up and stared into the dark water. Hey, you ghost that haunts this dark lake tonight. Do you hear me, ghost? he yelled. Peter loved to play games, so he answered using Captain Hook's voice. Yes, I hear you. Starkey and Smee held each other in fear. Who are you, stranger? Hook yelled. I am captain of the ship Jolly Roger, James Hook, answered Peter, using Hook's voice. You are not. I am Captain Hook. You lie, the voice answered. Say that again, and I will kill you with my iron hook. The real Captain Hook tried using a gentle voice. Hey, ghost, he called. Do you have another voice? Yes, came the answer. Are you a fish? No. Animal? No. Vegetable? No again. Are you a man? No. Are you a boy? Yes. You're just a common boy, Captain Hook asked. No, not a common boy. You'll never guess. Peter laughed at him. Do you give up? Yes, I give up, said Hook in a tired voice. Okay, I will tell you. I am Peter Pan. Hook instantly recovered when he heard this. Catch him! He cried to his men. Jump into the water, Smee. Starkey, you protect the boat. Catch him dead or alive. Hook jumped into the water and swam toward Peter, when he heard Peter's voice. Are you prepared, lost boys? Peter called out. Of course, said the lost boys from many places around the lake. They all began swimming toward the ship. The battle was fast and violent. John attacked first. He climbed bravely onto the pirate ship, grasped Starkey. And pulled away his sword. He then jumped back into the water. Starkey jumped after him, and the boat, with no men to watch it, began to float away slowly. In a different part of the lake, Smee attacked Tootles with his corkscrew, but before he could get Tootles, Curly hurt him with his knife. Captain Hook and Peter Pan fought each other on Death Rock. They had not planned to do this, but they had both climbed onto the rock from different sides and then fell down on the wet rock top. While trying to stop themselves from falling into the water, they grasped each other's arms. Peter pulled the knife from Captain Hook's belt and was about to push it into the pirate's chest when he stopped. He realized that he was higher on the rock than Hook. And that it wouldn't be a fair fight, so he grasped the pirate's arm and pulled him up higher. Suddenly, Hook's iron hand attacked him. Hook didn't think that fair fighting was important. Certainly, not like Peter did. As they were fighting, Captain Hook heard a sound, tick 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 tick. He instantly turned white with fear and swam wildly toward the pirate ship. The crocodile was following closely behind him. Chapter Nine, Trapped in the Lake. The lost boys could not find Peter or Wendy, but they found a small boat and rowed it back towards their secret home. Peter, Wendy, they shouted as they rowed through the lake, but they only heard the voices of the mermaids. After their little boat left the lake. Everything became silent. Then a wee cry came out. "Help, help us!" it said. It was the voice of Peter and Wendy. They were sitting on top of Death Rock. 
Wendy was too weak to stand up and was lying on Peter's arm. Using the last of his strength, Peter pulled Wendy up onto the top of the rock and then lay down to recover his strength. The water was coming higher and higher, and Peter knew that they would soon drown. Peter felt helpless for the first time in his life. The rock is becoming smaller, he said to Wendy. Soon the water will cover the rock. We must go quickly, she said. She did not fully understand the terrible situation. Should we fly or swim home? Wendy, can you fly or swim to the island without my help? Wendy told him that she was too tired. Peter cried loudly. What's wrong, Peter? she asked, becoming very worried. Hook hurt me, and I can't fly or swim. I cannot help you, Peter cried. Do you mean that we are both going to die? Look how fast the water is rising. They both covered their eyes with their hands. They did not want to see the water rising. Then Wendy felt something touch her leg. She looked and saw that it was Michael's kite. It must have been blown out of his hand and flew away. Peter grasped the kite and had an idea. Could this kite carry you home, Wendy? he asked. I don't think I can, she answered. It's only a kite. But here in Neverland, the winds are strong and the kites have magic power. Can it carry both of us? she asked. It can't lift two people, he answered. Toodles and Curly tried it before. Then you go, Peter. The boys need you to lead them and protect them. Never, he said. You are a lady. You must go. Peter tied the kite rope around her. She grasped his arm and refused to leave without him, but Peter would not go. Goodbye, wonderful Wendy. Take care of the lost boys for me, he said, and he pushed her toward the sky. A few moments later, she disappeared into the night. Peter was now alone on the rock. The water had come so high that there was hardly any space left to stand. To die will be my life's biggest adventure, he thought as he watched the water rise over his feet. The water soon covered Peter's legs and chest and neck. In only a few more minutes, it would cover his head too. Just then, he saw something moving on the lake. It looked like a big piece of paper. Peter wondered what it was. It was coming closer to him, and he saw that it was not a piece of paper, but was the mother bird. The bird was standing on her nest and trying to get the nest over to Peter. She spoke to him slowly and clearly Get into the nest and go to the shore. Peter was almost all covered by the water and forgot about being polite to ladies. What are you saying? he asked rudely. The bird repeated what she had said, but Peter still could not understand her. Finally, the bird became very angry and shouted, You dumb head! Do what I tell you! Shut up! Peter yelled back. Even though Peter was rude, The mother bird was still determined to save him. With a strong effort, she pushed the nest against the rock. Then she flew up into the air, leaving the nest empty, so that Peter would understand her meaning. Finally, Peter understood her. He grasped the nest and climbed in. He then waved his hand to thank the mother bird as she flew over his head. She was watching him to see what he would do with her two large eggs. Peter took off his hat and put the two eggs in it and pushed it towards the shore. The mother bird was happy to see that her eggs were safe. Peter then remembered that there was a pirate sword on the rock and he used it to row the nest to the shore. Peter reached the underground house 
about the same time as Wendy. All the lost boys were happy to see that Wendy and Peter were safe. The whole family had a huge pretended meal together to celebrate their victory against Captain Hook and the pirates. Chapter Ten, Ready to Go Home. When Tiger Lily returned to the Indians' camp, she told them how Peter Pan had saved her life. They were very thankful to Peter, and they had a huge party with the lost boys to celebrate. The lost boys and the Indians quickly became close friends. They decided to fight against the pirates together. Peter would pretend that he was an Indian captain and that the Indians were protecting his secret home from the pirates. Everyone knew that Captain Hook was planning to attack the Indians and the lost boys. They thought that they would attack soon. However, no one had guessed that this was the family's last night in their happy underground house. On this night, the family ate a large pretended dinner, and then Peter went outside to see what time it was. The only way to know the time in Neverland was to find the crocodile and wait near him until his clock bell rang on the hour. No one ever really knew what day it was, though, and of course they also didn't know the month or the year. The family decided to pretend that it was Saturday and have a party. They all stayed up very late, dancing and singing. After the party, Wendy told the boys to get ready for bed. Soon, Peter returned from outside, and they sat by the fire. I was wondering," Peter said, looking nervous. "We're only pretending that I am their father." "Of course," answered Wendy. "Good," he said, "because I would seem like an old adult if I was their real father." Wendy laughed. "You can be so silly, Peter." Wendy put the children in bed and began to tell them a story. Tonight she told them the story that Peter hated most. Once there was a gentleman. She started. Was there also a lady? Curly interrupted. Oh, mommy! Cried Nibs. There is also a lady, isn't there? She isn't dead, is she? Don't worry, my children. Wendy told them. There was also a lady. Their name was Darling. Mister and Missus Darling. I knew them," cried John. "I think I knew them too," cried Michael. The Darlings had three children," Wendy continued, "and the children had a dog called Nana who took care of them. One night, Mister Darling became angry at their dog Nana and tied her to a tree in the yard. And so all the children left the nursery and flew away. Where did they fly? Asked Curly, who knew the answer already. They all flew away to the Neverland, where the lost children live. Wendy told them. Oh, Wendy, was one of the lost children named Tootles? Asked Tootles. Yes, Tootles. I am in one of Wendy's stories. Tootles happily told the other boys, "I am too," shouted Curly. "Wasn't there a lost child called Curly?" "Yes," said Wendy. "How about us?" asked the twins. "Yes, all of you were there," said Wendy. "Now be silent for a minute and think about how unhappy the children's parents must have been with all their children so far away." So terrible," they said to make Wendy happy. However, they didn't really care. Think of all the empty beds in the nursery," she said. "I guess it is a little sad," said Nibs. "I don't think this story can have a happy ending," slightly said. "If you understood how great a mother's love is," Wendy explained, "you would not fear."
Wendy had now arrived at the part of her story that Peter hated most. I do like a mother's love, Nibs, Tootle said, hitting Nibs with his pillow. Of course, said Nibs, hitting Tootle's back. Well, Wendy continued, the mother's love was so great that she would always leave the window of the nursery open for her children to fly back. So they never worried about her and stayed in Neverland for years and had a wonderful time. Did they return home? asked Tootles. Well, said Wendy seriously, I will tell you about the future. Many years have passed, and a beautiful lady is getting off a train at London Station. Wendy, who is she? cried Nibs. Just as excited as if he really didn't know. It's the beautiful Wendy, and she is standing with two gentlemen, now adult men. Who are they? Well, they are John and Michael, all grown up and handsome. Wow! You see, my dear brothers, Wendy said to her brothers, pointing up to the sky, the nursery window is still open. And you will always be greatly rewarded for your deep faith in a mother's love. When the children flew home into their mommy and daddy's arms, it's impossible to tell you just how happy they all were. When Wendy finally finished her story, Peter made a deep, angry sound. The boys all jumped out of bed and ran to Peter to try to calm him down. He told them a story that he had never told anyone before. A long time ago, he began, I believe that my mother would always keep the nursery window open for me, so I stayed in Neverland for a few years and then flew back. When I arrived home, the windows were locked, because my mother had forgotten me and there was another boy sleeping in my bed. There is no way to know. If Peter's story was true, but he believed it was true, and that was the only important thing. Are you sure that all mothers are like that, Peter? Tootles asked him. Yes, I'm very sure. But Michael and John weren't so sure. Let's go back home, Wendy, they cried loudly. Yes, she cried, putting her arms around them. Don't leave tonight. All the lost boys cried. Yes, we must leave at once, Wendy said. Our mother and father may think that we are already dead. Wendy then turned to Peter. Will you help us prepare for our journey? If that is your wish, he replied, trying to be calm. In his heart, Peter cared very much. He did not want Wendy to leave. And he was full of anger at adults. Adults always ruined everything, he thought. Peter went out to tell the Indians that Wendy was leaving and that he would be gone for a few days. On the way back, he cried, but made himself stop crying before going inside the secret house. When Peter came back inside, he found great trouble in the house. The lost boys did not want Wendy to leave and had surrounded her angrily. She can't leave, said Slightly. We'll make her our prisoner, said Nibs. Tie her up, shouted the twins. Wendy asked Tootles to help her. I'm only Tootles, he said, and nobody ever cares what I think. But I will fight anyone who doesn't act like a gentleman to Wendy. We will not keep Wendy here against her wishes, Peter said clearly. The Indians will take you and your brothers through the woods, and then Tinker Bell will fly you across the sea. Thank you, Peter, said Wendy politely. Wake up, Tinker Bell, Peter yelled. Tink was not sleeping. She was listening to their conversation, and although she was happy that Wendy was leaving, She hated Wendy and didn't want to help her. No, she yelled. Tinker Bell didn't often argue with Peter. He didn't like it. Get dressed at once, Tinker Bell, 
or I will open your curtains and all the lost boys will see you wearing your night clothes. The fairy jumped up and was ready immediately. Wendy turned to say goodbye to the lost boys. When she looked at their sad faces and eyes, she felt pity for them. My dear children, she said, if you all come back with me, I am sure that my parents will care for you. She had meant the invitation especially for Peter, but the other boys all jumped with joy. Won't they think we're too much trouble? Nibs asked. No, no, Wendy told them. We can put a few more beds in the nursery. Peter, can we go? They asked. All right, he replied in an angry voice. The boys all ran quickly to prepare their things. Peter, aren't you going to get your things ready? Wendy asked. Here, Peter, I will give you some medicine for strength before you go, said Wendy, thinking that Peter was going to come with them. Wendy didn't really have any medicine and could only give Peter some water, but she looked serious and measured it carefully so that it would seem like medicine. When she finished, Peter said, I'm not going with you, Wendy. What? But you must come, Peter, she cried. No, Peter yelled angrily. But you should find your mother. No, I don't want to find her. She would say that I was getting old, and I never want to become an adult. I want to be a little boy forever and to have fun always. Wendy could not do anything except tell the other boys that Peter wasn't coming with them. They stared at him and could not believe it, but they all knew they could not change his mind. If you find your mothers, Peter said seriously, I hope you will like them. He then turned to Wendy and weakly held up his hand. Goodbye, he said simply. Will you remember to take your medicine, Peter? Wendy asked. Yes, of course. And will you wash your clothes every week? Yes. Peter's face showed no feelings. Are you ready, Tink? he called. Yes, the fairy replied. Then lead them home. Chapter 11 Capture. Wendy, her brothers, and the lost boys were all ready to go now. They grabbed their things and Tink flew outside to go and find the Indians. The children were about to leave the secret house when they heard loud screams outside. It was the sound of the Indians and the pirates fighting. The fight sounded fierce and violent. Wendy and the boys were glad. That they were safe in the secret house underground. They looked at Peter, wondering what he planned to do. Without saying anything, he grabbed his sword. The Indians could have called out for help, but their laws said that they couldn't show surprise in front of their enemies. Because of this, the Indians stayed sitting for too long after the pirates suddenly appeared. By the time they reached for their weapons, many had already been killed. The Indians were brave and they killed many of the pirates. Sadly, in the end, the Indians were all killed. Even the brave and beautiful Tiger Lily fell to her death. After this great battle, the pirates did not return to their ship. Instead, they moved towards the Lost Boy's secret house. Their main goal that night was not to kill the Indians, but to destroy the lost boys, capture Wendy, and especially kill Peter Pan. It was strange that a big and strong man like Captain James Hook cared so much about killing a small boy like Peter Pan. But Hook truly hated Pan. He hated him because Peter had cut off his arm. And fed it to the great crocodile. But Hook hated Peter even more because he was a show off. Everyone on the island loved Peter and hated Hook, and he couldn't wait 
to push his iron hand into Peter's heart. The pirates still had one problem: the holes in the trees were too small for adults, and they didn't have any way to get down into the secret house. They stood above the house and listened down the chimney. Down below, Wendy and the lost boys were silent. They all felt very frightened. They knew that the battle must have ended because it was now silent outside, but they did not know who had won. When the Indians win a battle, Peter finally said, "They always hit their drums. That is their sign of victory." The pirates heard what Peter said and smiled terrible smiles. Captain Hook told the pirates to go to get the drums from the dead Indians and hit them for a while. Smee went and hit the drums, and after two hits, Hook heard Peter cry happily, "I hear drums! The Indians won the battle!" The children shouted happily and again prepared to leave. They again said goodbye to Peter and grasped their things. They did not know the terrible danger waiting for them outside. Hook ordered his men to wait by each of the trees with holes. The first boy to come out was Curly. Seco grasped him and tied a cloth around his mouth before he could yell for help. He was then thrown at Captain Hook's feet. All of the boys were captured in the same way. Wendy was the last to come out, but she was not grasped or thrown. Captain Hook, strangely, was a gentleman. He took off his hat and bowed to her. He then offered her his right arm, and gently walked with her to the place where the others were tied up. Wendy was so surprised that she didn't yell to Peter. She was just a young girl. The pirates quickly tied up all the boys except Slightly. Slightly was too fat. And the rope they had was not long enough. At first, Captain Hook was very annoyed, but he quickly became quite happy. Hook realized that one of the holes into the secret house must be longer than the others to fit Slightly's fat body. The horrible and violent pirate planned to use this hole to get into the secret house and kill Peter Pan. Hook ordered the pirates to carry the children back to their ship. The pirates threw all the kids into Wendy's little house, and then used their strong arms to carry the whole house back to the ship. Hook stayed above the secret house and waited for night time. When night arrived, Captain Hook climbed into the large hole in Slightly's tree. He was almost too big to get into the tree, and he had to take off his thick coat to fit in. Moving inside the hole was hard for Hook, but he eventually got down to the bottom and looked around the secret house with great interest. Finally, his eyes found their target. Peter Pan was sleeping alone in the huge bed. When he saw the boy, Hook filled with anger. He tried to move closer toward the bed, but he couldn't fit through the small end of Slightly's hole. He reached out toward Peter with his iron hook, but the sleeping boy was too far away. Hook became more and more angry. He had come so far, but could still not move the last distance to kill his enemy. He worried that Peter was going to escape him again. Suddenly, Hook saw Peter's medicine bottle sitting on the table. The table was close enough that Hook could reach it. The horrible pirate then had an idea. He always carried a small bottle of poison in his pocket. He had it so that he could kill himself if one of his enemies ever captured him alive. He put five drops of his terrible yellow poison into Peter's medicine bottle. Then Hook looked one last time at the sleeping boy. He climbed back up the tree and put on his black coat and pirate hat. As he walked back to his ship, he laughed and whispered what he had done to himself. Chapter Twelve: Tinker Bell Saves Peter. 
Peter had felt very sad when Wendy and the boys left. He was all alone now. He had gone to bed without dinner or a story from Wendy and had slept deeply all night. Peter finally awoke when he heard a knocking on the door of his tree. Peter quickly pulled out his knife. Who's out there? he shouted. There was no answer. Speak if you want to come in, he said louder. He listened quietly and heard a sound like bells from the other side of the door. Please let me in, Peter, said Tink. Peter opened the door and felt a little bit happy. At least he still had one friend, even if a small friend. Tink flew inside, full of excitement. She was covered with dirt and began talking quickly. Tinkerbell had learned many things while she was out. She knew that the pirates had killed all the Indians and captured the boys. She had even heard Hook laughing about putting poison in Peter's medicine. What's the problem, Tink? The pirates killed all the Indians and captured Wendy and the boys, she said all at once. She then described how the pirates had tied all the boys up and taken them to their ship. I'll save them, cried Peter. Grasping his sword, I'll drink Wendy's medicine to give me more strength. No! yelled Tink, who had not yet told Peter about the poison. Why shouldn't I drink my medicine? asked Peter, with a strange look on his face. There's poison in it! Poison? Who could have put poison in it? Captain Hook did. That's crazy. Hook couldn't have come down here. You're just jealous of Wendy. Tinkerbell could not explain how Hook came down because she didn't know about Slightly's large hole. Peter raised the poison cup to his mouth, but before he could drink it, Tinkerbell flew between the cup and his lips and drank all the medicine. How dare you drink all my medicine? Peter shouted in anger. The fairy couldn't answer. She was already becoming sick. What's wrong? he said in a worried voice. He could see Tink's face turning green. It was poisoned. I am going to die, she said softly. Oh, Tink, did you drink the poison to save me? Yes, I did, she replied softly. She then fell down on Peter's bed. Her light became darker and darker. When the light went out, she would be dead. Tink began to whisper something quietly. Peter came close to her and tried to hear what she was saying. She said that she might be able to live if children still believed in fairies. Since there were not any children in the house now, Peter looked up to the sky and asked all the children who were dreaming of Neverland in the whole world. Do you believe in fairies? he yelled out to them. Tink listened to hear the voices that would decide if she would live or die. She could hear many say a soft yes. If you really believe, clap your hands loudly. Please, don't let Tink die, Peter cried. Then Tink and Peter heard a great clapping coming from thousands of children's hands all over the world. Then all the clapping stopped because all the mothers of the world had run into their nurseries to see what their children were doing. But already Tink's life was saved. Her light became bright and her voice strong. She began to fly rapidly around the room. They believe, she cried happily. Now I must go to save Wendy, said Peter. He grasped his sword and went up his tree. He wanted to fly quickly, but he knew the pirates would see him in the moonlight. He needed to surprise them, so he walked quietly like the Indians walked. While he walked, not a single animal except the great crocodile passed him, and the night was silent. Peter thought about Hook and Wendy. And promised himself a terrible promise. Hook or I will die this time.
Chapter Thirteen, The Jolly Roger. The pirate ship was called the Jolly Roger. It was a strange name for a ship that was such a sad and terrible place. The pirates had done so many bloody and terrible acts on this old ship. Peter soon reached the water and looked for the pirate ship. He saw it floating in the water not far from the shore. There was a strange green light hanging over the ship. The rest of the lake was dark. The pirates were all drinking, gambling, shouting, and laughing hard. Some pirates, tired from carrying the house full of children, were sleeping. Captain Hook was walking around the ship. He was thinking hard about everything that had happened that day. He was feeling troubled because he felt sad. He should be happy today. He thought, he had destroyed and captured all of his enemies: the Indians, the Lost Boys, and mostly Peter Pan. At least he believed that he did. Soon he would make all the boys jump into the sea and would make Wendy become his mother. Then his victory would be complete. Still, Hook felt quite sad. He was sad because he felt so alone. The other pirates were all of low class and low culture. He was born in a high position and was educated, and he felt that the other men were just like the beasts on the island. He had nobody to talk to and nobody to love. The pirates were all happy though; they danced wildly and drank to celebrate their victory. Hook scolded them and told them that there was still important business to do. Bring up the children," Hook ordered the pirates. "Yes, Captain." The boys were all pulled up and were dropped on the hard floor in front of Captain Hook. "Listen to me, children," Hook smiled. "There are eight of you here, but only six of you will be thrown into the sea tonight. I will need two servant boys. Which two of your boys want to become my servants?" Toodles moved forward two steps. He looked at the captain seriously. Well, sir, I don't think my mother would want me to become a pirate. Would your mother want you to become a pirate, Nibs? I don't think she would. Nibs replied. How about your mother, Slightly? What would she say? She would certainly agree with yours, Curly. What would? Be quiet, all of you useless boys! Shouted Captain Hook. He then turned towards John. How about you, boy? Have you ever wanted to be a pirate? John had listened to the pirate silently, and he seemed a little happy that the captain had asked him. I might like to be a pirate. I used to pretend that I was a pirate called Red Hand Jack. He said, "That's a great pirate name." Smiled Hook. We would all call you that name if you join us. What would my pirate name be? Michael called out. You would be Blackbeard Joe. What do you think, John? Michael asked his brother. I don't know. What do you think, Michael? John replied. You're older, John. You have to decide. John turned towards Hook and asked. Would we still be gentlemen working under the King of England? He asked seriously. The captain suddenly became very angry. Certainly not. All pirates must promise death to the king. He replied. Then I refuse to be a pirate. Yelled John. I refuse too. Repeated Michael. Hook's face was very angry. If that is your wish, then you will die. He screamed. Get Wendy and prepare the children. He ordered. Wendy hated the pirates more than she had ever hated anything. John and Michael were interested by pirate adventures, but Wendy, who cared a lot about having a nice home, saw only that the pirate ship was dirty and even covered with blood in some places. It looked like it had never been cleaned. Garbage was piled high, and Wendy thought it was horrible. The glass windows on the ship were so dirty that you could not see light through them. My beautiful lady, you will now watch your children jump into the sea.
said Hook, watching Wendy with a terrible smile. Will they die? asked Wendy, in a voice full of hatred. Yes, he yelled. Be quiet, everyone. We will let their mother say last words to her children. Wendy did not pause and instantly began to speak. These are my last words to you, my children, Wendy said, looking at each boy with great love. I will say what I believe your real mothers would have said, and it is this. We wish that our sons will die like true English gentlemen. The pirates were all deeply impressed and became silent. The boys all cried out bravely. I will die like a gentleman as my mother wishes, the boys all said. Quiet! yelled Hook. Tie her up, Smee. As Smee tied Wendy's hands to the ship, he whispered, I promise to save you if you will be my mother. Wendy turned her head away with great hate in her eyes. I would rather have no children than have a pirate child, she answered. She knew that even if she agreed to be his mother, the boys would still die. The children were all looking down at the deep and dark water. They wanted to be brave and die like true gentlemen, but when they looked at the water, they felt very afraid. Hook moved toward Wendy. He was going to turn her face so that she would see each boy jump to their death. But before he reached her, he heard the sound of the great crocodile. Tick, tick, tick. The fierce Captain James Hook suddenly changed. Before, he looked like a terrible beast. Now, he looked like a scared little animal. A terrifying thought came into Hook's mind. The crocodile is on the ship. He ran around wildly, looking for a place to hide. The boys all moved over to the side of the ship. Pulling their chains with them to watch the crocodile come closer. But when they looked into the water, there was no crocodile. Instead, they saw Peter Pan. Peter moved his hand to tell the boys to stay silent so the pirates would not know he was there. Peter then continued imitating the ticking clock sound of the great crocodile. Chapter 14 Fight to the death. Peter had run as fast as his legs could across the whole island. The whole time he ran, he was thinking about two things saving Wendy and killing Hook. Truthfully, Peter had often felt that fighting the pirates was a game, but now he realized that it was serious. As he ran, he grasped his knife tighter and tighter. Before arriving at the lake, Peter saw the great crocodile swimming slowly along the island's river. He noticed that the crocodile wasn't making a ticking sound. The clock must have stopped working. Peter could imitate any sound and started imitating the tick sound so that the beasts on the island would think he was the crocodile and run away. When he arrived at the lake and began swimming, He continued making the ticking sound. Peter was a fast swimmer. He reached the pirate ship quickly. He climbed onto the ship and looked around. He thought that if he climbed on, he had to be silent, but he saw all the pirates standing closely around Hook and guarding him. Hook looked very frightened, just like a little child. Peter then remembered that he himself had been making the crocodile sound as he swam, and that Hook thought the crocodile was close by. Just as Peter climbed onto the ship, a pirate came out of the ship's kitchen and moved towards the place where Peter Pan was standing. Peter was very fast, and he quickly pushed his knife deep into the pirate's chest. Peter covered the pirate's mouth so that he could not scream. And then threw the dead body into the water. He did all of this in less than one minute. The children could see Peter do this, but the pirates, who were all guarding the captain at the front of the boat, could not. Peter walked into the kitchen quietly. The pirates heard the sound of the crocodile disappear and began to relax. 
When Hook recovered his breath and courage, he thought about the prisoners again. He was embarrassed that the boys and Wendy had seen him be so scared and weak, and he hated them even more. He became angry and asked the children, Would you boys like to be whipped before we throw you into the water to die? No, they all cried loudly and fell to their knees, begging for mercy. Hook smiled his terrible smile. Go, get my whip, Jukes, he ordered. It's in the kitchen. The kitchen. Peter was in the kitchen. The boys stared at each other and didn't know what to do. Jukes entered the kitchen, and the door closed loudly behind him. Suddenly, a horrible scream filled the air. After the scream, the boat was filled with a strange singing sound. The pirates did not understand this strange sound, but the boys all knew that it was Peter's victory song. What was that? asked Hook, shocked. Chico, go to see what happened, the captain ordered. Seco was the bravest of the pirates, but he did not want to go. Hook raised up his iron hook to Seco's neck, making him obey. Seco turned around and slowly walked into the kitchen. Again, there was a terrible scream, and then Peter's victory song. Enough! yelled Hook. Who will go to the kitchen and get the killer? His eyes stared at Starkey. Did I hear you say yes? Hook asked Starkey with a horrible smile. No, I didn't, the terrified pirate cried. But I think you did, said the captain, raising his iron hook to Starkey's neck. Let's first wait until Chico comes back, Starkey said. The rest of the pirates nodded their heads to agree. I suggest that you go immediately, screamed Hook, bringing the hook up just over Starkey's head. I'd rather jump into the sea, Starkey said. Is this a mutiny? yelled Hook with great power in his voice. Please have mercy, Captain, Starkey cried. Hook brought his terrible iron hand down close to Starkey's head. The other pirates just stood where they were. None of them dared to stop him. Go! yelled Hook. Starkey began to walk toward the kitchen. Before he got there, he let out a scream of sadness and jumped off the ship into the sea. The pirates were all silent for a moment. Then Captain Hook yelled, You're all as scared and weak as little boys, he screamed. I'll go get the killer myself. Hook grasped a light and raised his iron hook, then walked slowly into the kitchen. A short moment later, he came back without the light. Something grabbed my light, he explained weakly. What happened to Jukes and Chico? the other pirates asked. They're both dead, replied Hook. Hook did not want to go back into the kitchen, and it made him look scared and weak in front of his men. We're all going to die, cried one pirate. The children all began yelling happily at the pirate's fear. Hook was fighting to control his men and almost forgot about his prisoners. I have an idea, pirates, Hook said to his men. Let's make the children go in and fight the murderer. If they kill him, it is good for us. If he kills all of them, we will not care. The pirates all thought that this was a great idea and began to push the boys into the kitchen. The boys all pretended to be afraid as the pirates pushed them. Wendy was still tied up outside and waited for Peter to come out and save her. Meanwhile, Peter had found the key to unlock the boys' chains in the kitchen. He unlocked their chains and they were free. He then told them to let out horrible screams so that the pirates would think that they were killed. When the pirates heard all of the boys screaming, they began to be very afraid, and some jumped off the ship into the water. All the boys found knives and other things they could use as weapons in the kitchen. Peter told them that they should go unlock Windy and fly away together, but then he remembered his promise.
Hook or I will die this time. We must fight and stop these pirates forever, he told the boys. Peter quickly and quietly went out to where Wendy was chained and unlocked her. Hook and the pirates were still at the front of the ship, scared from all the screams in the kitchen. Everything was ready, so Peter called out, Come, boys, and attack them! The boys ran forward shouting and carrying their weapons. The sound of swords and screams of excitement filled the air as the boys took revenge on the pirates. There were still many pirates on the ship, and they might have beaten the boys. But instead of staying together, they ran wildly around the ship, each man only thinking of his own life. After a long fight, all of the pirates were dead except Captain Hook. Hook was so terrible that even while alone, he seemed as strong as the whole group of boys. Each time they attacked him, he fought them back. Put down your weapons, boys, Peter yelled in a loud voice. This fight is mine. The boys stepped back, and Peter Pan came face to face with Captain James Hook. Dark and horrible man, I will kill you, Peter said. The fight began. Hook was much bigger and stronger than Peter Pan, but Peter could fly. He flew around so quickly that Hook could not hit him. In the end, Peter was too fast for Captain Hook. Each time that Hook attacked with his sword, Peter would quickly make a small cut in Hook's face. Then Peter swung his knife and hit Hook's sword out of his hand. Hook attacked wildly with his iron hook, but Peter was too far in the air. Finally, Hook was too tired to fight. He saw Peter preparing his knife for a final cut. Hook ran to the side of the ship and jumped into the water. However, Hook did not look before he jumped. The great crocodile was waiting there silently in the water. The crocodile's mouth opened wide when he saw Hook jump. Hook's arm had been the most delicious thing that the crocodile had ever eaten. He had waited many years to eat his whole body. As Hook fell, he saw the crocodile rise up out of the water and open his great mouth. Hook screamed a terrible scream as the crocodile bit into his leg and pulled him under the water. This was the end of Captain James Hook, one of the most violent and terrible pirates in history. Chapter 15 Going Back Home After the great battle, the children were all very happy. They sailed the pirate ship back to land. Peter put on Hook's hat and sat in the captain's seat proudly. They sailed for many days towards the Azores Islands. The whole time they traveled, they danced and chatted and ate all the food that the pirates had on the ship. Wendy even took the old pirate clothes she found and made new clothes for all the boys. After arriving at the island, they all flew back to England together. One Thursday in June, Mrs. Darling was sleeping in a chair in the nursery when Wendy, John, and Michael flew in through the open window and landed quietly on the floor. I recognize this place, said Michael. Of course you do, Wendy smiled. This is your room. And there is Nana's doghouse, said John excitedly. He ran over and looked inside. Nana's not in there, he said. There's a man inside. The children all came over and looked in. It's father, said Wendy, surprised. Father, he is not even as big as the pirate that I killed, said Michael proudly. And there is mother. She's sitting in her favorite chair, Wendy cried. Let's get into our beds so she can find us there. Mrs. Darling soon woke up and found them, but she had dreamed of finding them in their beds so many times that she thought that she was still dreaming. She returned to her chair and sat down. The children were all very upset, and tears fell from their eyes. Mother! Wendy cried. That's Wendy's voice, said Mrs. Darling, 
still not sure if she was dreaming or awake. Mother, cried John. That's John's voice. Mother, Michael sang out. Together, the three children all ran to their mother and she put her arms around them. George, she cried out. Come quickly. Their father came out of the doghouse and put his arms around the children. Nana heard the happy cries and ran in to join them. Peter Pan was outside the window, watching the happy family. He wondered sadly if any of his exciting adventures could be as wonderful as this beautiful family. Chapter 16 A Bigger Family while Wendy, John, and Michael were upstairs with their parents, the lost boys were waiting calmly outside. They wanted to give Wendy time to tell her parents about them. Soon Mrs. Darling opened the front door and they all entered the hall. They stood in a line smiling in front of Mr. and Mrs. Darling, took off their hats, and tried to act like gentlemen. They looked quite silly wearing their pirate clothes. Mrs. Darling was happy to have them join her family, but Mr. Darling worried that the family didn't have enough money to raise nine children. Mrs. Darling was embarrassed at her husband's worries, and he finally agreed that they could all become one big happy family. Peter landed next to Wendy and said a final goodbye. Mrs. Darling stood close beside her daughter, worried that Wendy might disappear again. She told Peter that she would be happy to be his mother also. Would you teach me to read and send me to school? He asked. Yes. And then to work in an office? Yes, one day. Would I grow up into a man? Yes, very soon. Peter looked scared. No, I don't want those things, he said. No one is going to make me become an adult. But where will you live? Mr. Darling asked. I'll go back to Neverland and live with Tinkerbell in the house that we all built for Wendy, he said. The fairies can put the house up into the tall trees where they live. How wonderful, Wendy exclaimed. Her voice was so full of desire that her mother came over and grasped her hand to make sure she didn't fly off again with Peter at that very moment. I didn't think there were still any fairies. I thought they were all dead, Mrs. Darling said. There are always new fairies, Wendy calmly told her mother. When a baby laughs for the first time, a new fairy is born. The white ones are girls and the purple ones are boys. Will you join me in my little house in the trees, Wendy? Peter asked Wendy hopefully. May I go, please, Mommy? No, certainly not, said Mrs. Darling. I have waited a long time for you to return home. I hope to keep you here. But Peter needs a mother to take care of him, she cried. So do you, my wonderful daughter, replied Mrs. Darling. Finally, Peter flew away, but before he left, he made Wendy promise to come and see him once a year. Mrs. Darling agreed. Like she promised, she went to see Peter every year until she was quite old. Then Wendy married and had a baby of her own and truly became a mother. She called her daughter Jane, and Jane flew to the Neverland with Peter every year. When Jane grew up, she had a baby also, named Margaret. Soon, Margaret will go see the Neverland and someday in the future... Margaret will have a daughter, and she will fly to the Neverland also. And children will do this forever, for as long as they believe in their dreams. <laughs>